discussion ahead. We are going to throw up a menti poll, I believe. Okay, well being, faith leaders. Oh, controversial, good. We're gonna have a good discussion, effective, community involvement, taboo context specific hope of oh, some good things i'm going to give you i'm going to give 20 more seconds okay okay meditation culturally sensitive great 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 this is great um you see well-being kind of there at the center uh, effective and well-being kind of getting a little bit a little bit bigger so great uh great to just get our minds thinking uh, about some of the, and, and I appreciate the the number of words that that look at kind of the controversial, complex nature uh, of this, which I think we'll have some opportunity to talk through in the coming hour. Uh, without uh, further ado, uh, maybe we'll, if people are still filling in, maybe we'll come back to this at the end if it, if it goes any further. Um, but without further ado, I really, I want to introduce to you today, Allison Schaefer, who is the WHO special, who leads the WHO special initiative for mental health, and who is one of the authors of the Interagency Standing Committee Faith Sensitive Guidelines for, for Mental Health and psych Psychosocial Support, which is provided a great foundation for a lot of this work and reflects her decades of experience in this. So over to you, Allie. Thanks so much, Andrea. Um, everybody, it's a, it's a pleasure to offer a few opening remarks in today's session about faith sensitive MHPSS and children on the move. In my remarks, I'm going to go a little bit broad so that uh, we can hear from some of our panelists later um, and they can delve into some of the more specifics. I wanna share with you that the idea of faith sensitive MHPSS was something I became really cognizant of many years ago uh, when I was involved in the 2010 Haiti earthquake response. We were responding to MHPSS uh, with interventions as usual and in many instances, that didn't go so it didn't go down so well with the local communities. Their um their faith shaped their sense of meaning and their sense of hopefulness, especially during that time of need and uncertainty. And of course, this is the case for millions of people of faith from around the world who are affected by crisis every day. Over the years, I've heard and contributed to various debates about faith sensitive. Uh, mental health and psychosocial support. Arguments have ranged from the suggestion that faith has no role to play in our humanitarian actions, right through to some organizations that seek to serve only certain people of certain faith, uh, faith beliefs. I'm pleased to say that I think that the debates have come a long way over the last 10 to 15 years. Dialogue has rightly become more nuanced and practical and much more accepted for us to actually engage in these debates. We even now have guidance and resources on the topics, which, uh, which Andrea alluded to, and some of the resources from uh, PART and other faith-based organisations is, is also well known to many of you. I think it's safe to say that most humanitarians now affirm the importance of the spiritual beliefs and practices of crisis affected children and their families, notably where such beliefs are already part of their cultural and social traditions. We understand that respecting and responding to people's faith does not equate to jeopardizing our humanitarian principle of neutrality, but in fact can be viewed as ensuring our neutrality um, by by acknowledging and respecting those traditions of the people affected. And of course, it also goes to our humanitarian mandate to save lives and reduce suffering. But I wanna to suggest to you that we can't always just stand on principles alone. Um, as a representative of WHO, I wanna to say to you that one of our core values at WHO is to be professionals who are committed to excellence in health and to achieve this, WHO is guided by the best available science, evidence and technical expertise. So 
It's well established that faith, or for those who believe, can support positive coping strategies. It can enhance social cohesion and social capital, amongst other things. Hopefulness in crisis is another really important addition that faith offers to many people. For children in particular, faith can be a really important structure for their social development as they learn about humanity. And in really simple terms, faith can help them ascertain a sense of right and wrong. MHPSS work in emergencies can naturally align with faith or spirituality, which, whichever terms you prefer to use. Working alongside faith communities or faith leaders or working in MHPSS programs are both, I apologize about my cat there. They're both, um, they're both prospective entry points for each other. But I wanna to suggest to you that unless we build the evidence, we can demonstrate that these approaches are not causing any unintended harm and that they are as effective or more effective than generic MHPSS approaches. There is a risk that we ultimately don't get to deliver within the framework of the humanitarian principles at all. Evidence can help us uphold our humanitarian principle of neutrality and to reduce suffering. And taking a principled and evidence-based approach can help us deliver MHPSS in more relevant, culturally and faith-sensitive ways. We need a deliberate investment in this. Of course, financial, but we also need a time investment. We need to invest our professional resources, partnerships, cross-sectoral or interfaith collaborations. These aspects will ultimately help us improve on meeting the holistic needs of children, including those most vulnerable and on the move. There's some important progress that's taken place over the years. That progress has focused on community-based mental health and psychosocial support actions and interventions, as well as for faith-sensitive MHPSS. With regards to people and children on the move, I think we would all do well to always remember that when girls, boys, women and men move from place to place, sometimes from one crisis to the next, their faith is not something that they leave behind. Faith is usually stable in people's lives and it moves with them. So I want to encourage us to keep talking and working towards meeting the needs of people, especially children on the move, and the ways that we can promote and support their faith beliefs um, as a way to also in support their well-being. So thanks for a chance to contribute today. I look forward to hearing from the other panelists and uh, and contributing if you have questions. Back to you, Andrea. Thanks so much. The, the call to have both a principled and an evidence-based approach is, is very important. Um, I really appreciate that. We now are going to move into a keynote video from Dr. Carlos Bayard, who is the Associate Professor at Loma Linda University School of Medicine and the Director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Training in Community Mental Health. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, it is a pleasure to uh, be here with you uh, and uh, have a brief oversight of how uh, psychosocial support and mental health can be strengthened uh, for children on the move. And basically, I'll make two points. The first one is that we have to be able to connect the dots that may facilitate uh, this process. And the second point is to address the elephant in the room, so to speak. That is what elements that perhaps are unspoken or unseen and yet have a very relevant impact on how we do what we do. So th there is a very important document that can guide you through how then you can bridge the gap to increase access and inclusiveness. And these are the uh, dots that need to be connected. Naturally, this is very complicated and very involved, uh, and we're not going to go into any detail, but this is just to highlight the level of complexity that we are facing when we talk about uh, the uh, psychosocial support and mental health for children on the move. Elements that have to do with politics, with external factors, with internal dynamics, 
and uh, so on and so forth. So this is just to indicate uh, that indeed it's very important that we pay attention to a number of different factors. But one that I think needs to be highlighted is that forced display displacement, and this for children is always the case, by the way. Children are not the one that make the ones that make decisions for move, even if the move of immigration or migration is one that you know is is not due to conflict. Uh, it, it is the, the parents the ones that make decisions. So forced displacement, and particularly in context of uh, uh, conflict, then create major life crises. And when people are facing major life crises, we all turn to something that might give us a sense of meaning and solace. And for most people in the planet, uh, that is in the form of their faith, and their religion, and their spirituality. So that creates a natural place of convergence as to where psychosocial support and mental health can be provided. In fact, in many places, spiritual leaders are on the front lines in prov providing mental health and psychosocial support in disadvantaged uh, communities. In fact, in most places, they will see people like a clergy or other spiritual leaders before they would see someone like myself, uh, a trained clinical psychologist. So this document highlights how we can turn challenges into opportunities. And one of the ways to do that is to build the capacity of local faith actors to actually deliver what they actually do, but do it better and with proper uh, support. So we need to then uh, integrate faith sensitive approaches that should start by recognizing that religious practices can be an element of support that should be complemented rather than replaced by other forms of interventions. We shouldn't be inviting or expecting or asking these populations to be converted, if you will, to the language of science or mental health, but we ought to make the work of trying to engage them where they're found and with their own uh, ways of understanding things. So how do we do this? By creating long-term long multi-stakeholder partnerships to support this approach in which then face sensitive uh, interventions are well integrated with the goal of supporting children on the move. So now to the second point, the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room, in my modest uh, view, is that there, there are different worldviews that are held by uh, faith communities and the scientific community, and oftentimes the communities that are, you know, uh, participating, funding these initiatives. People of faith believe what they believe as power and truth. They don't see what they believe and their practices as just a cultural narrative, rather they see it as truth and the source of understanding, the source of meaning, and oftentimes the source of solace. Whereas on the other hand, uh, the scientific community and many times the organizations that provide the funding, they have a different worldview that is a scientific worldview and the two do not necessarily mesh. So, as I was saying, the worldview for faith communities is truth and power. Their explanatory models of illness and healing are different to the models that are used by uh, evidence-based approaches, and so it is the uh, therapeutic processes. Now, the, on the other hand, the scientific community, the worldview that they embrace is a naturalistic one, an emphasis in biopsychosocial approaches, and the therapeutic processes tend to be medical or evidence-based. We say research shows the person of faith then would invoke their uh, higher power to be the process through which healing takes place. So this is an elephant in the room. That is how then can we develop a sense of trust so that indeed these uh, two communities that clearly need each other can happen. So what's why is there mistrust? Well, uh, communities that provide the funding have a natural concern about how uh, their money can be used to advance a religious or a political standpoint. Uh, 
However, many times the neutrality clause that is says, well, we cannot, we don't want to sort of get entangled in that, inadvertently reinforces a harmful dislocation of displaced children from their faith and cultural identities. In other words, by cutting off this aspect of their lives, in reality, it is sort of an imposition, if you will, of a secular worldview that then delegitimizes the way they see things. And in fact, as the document states, responders are in fact violating the principle of neutrality in that they are unintentionally advancing a secular uh, viewpoint. So uh, there is a disconnect between the worldviews. Uh, oftentimes there's mistrust because it, some faith actors uh, that provide the support are not strategically supported. And some donors and service providers in the formal response sector fear that faith actors may lack the appropriate commitment to serve all who are in need. And in fact, they would only focus on their own community and uh, ignore the others or be prejudiced in terms of others. So what are the building blocks uh, for trust? Well. I think that it's very important to use an implementation science approach, uh, which basically indicates that from a position of cultural humility, humility, then uh, we meet with all community stakeholders to really understand their perspective. It's very important to identify local champions that understand both worlds, someone that has to be bilingual, so to speak, bilingual in the sense that they understand the language of intervention, but they also understand, not just understand in that they have a cognitive understanding, but they also have a personal understanding of the worldview that informs uh, the faith community. So the other thing that is quite crucial is to identify a common ground. The common ground may imply that then uh, uh, non-religious actors uh, and inter people that are providing interventions get, they need to develop religious literacy, understand the worldview that they are trying to, of those that are trying to serve. It's also very important to identify the dark side of faith traditions. Uh, research on spiritual struggles have made this very, very clear uh, that, that indeed, you know, even though faith uh, traditions tend to uh, be uh, protective factors when it comes to mental health, sometimes also may have a negative impact, so that needs to be identified. Also, it's very important to identify potential culture and faith adaptations to the approaches and therapeutic interventions. We need to stay away from intellectual colonizing, and we should not be afraid of using the language of faith that is meaningful to the community. That then that language translates actually the psychological concepts that we're trying to use to assist uh, them. Uh, the other point that the document makes, which is very important, is capacity sharing. That is, there is a need for uh, literacy uh, learning from both sides, and uh, faith leaders need to also learn something about what the interventions uh, mean, what they can do, what they cannot do and so on and so forth. So it's very important capacity sharing, uh, be intentional in uh, fostering dialogue, and in fact, creating moments when the training is happening for the implementation that will be involving uh, all groups. Uh, it's also very important that faith actors stay, uh, that you understand that faith actors stay, whereas uh, in, people that intervene, funding organizations, you come and you go. So how then uh, sustainability is protected and nurtured, that is crucial. Finally, faith communities and faith leaders in this context, including informal leaders who are perhaps youth or respected women and men of faith who do not have a formal type title, yet they can be a tremendous resource. This is stated by the document, and of course I fully, fully agree with that. But then one needs to be aware of a balance of power. That is, if you step on somebody's toes, and worldviews, again, can clash in terms of some of these variables, the problem with that is that you could easily be sabotaged, and therefore all your efforts may be rendered uh, uh, for nothing. And this is my last point. Uh, building trust requires time, continuity, commitment. 
as it's saying said, goes, Rome was not built in a day and neither will be these interventions. With this, I would like to again express my gratitude to you for attending this portion of my presentation and uh, to my friends in the various organizations that are associated uh, to bring about the change that we all hope may happen for children in the mood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Friard. I, I think that was a beautiful sort of underscoring um, of the importance of principles and evidence and moving from an, from an either or approach to a both and thinking about capacity sharing um, and that faith communities and faith leaders and mental health practitioners all have things, they, we have things, we all have things to teach each other um, in this space and, the, and an opportunity to um, continue working together uh, for the sake of children. Um, now to present the policy paper that a number of organizations under the umbrella of the Partnership on Religion for Development have been, have been working on, I wanna introduce Dr. Kathleen Rutledge, uh, an independent consultant and MHPSS lecturer at the Institute for Global Health and Development at Queen Margaret University. Over to you, Dr. Rutledge. You are muted. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, here's the presentation. Um, thank you for that introduction, Andrea, um, and for the opportunity to speak with each of you today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the the document that um, Dr. Fayard was was referring to um, is essentially a policy brief that will be released released shortly, and it summarizes um, one of the, the the recent dialogues that Andrea was talking about and. This is a dialogue um, that's building on a, a brief that PARD has written um, related to uh, best practices in terms of faith sensitive support for, for children on the move, MHPSS for children on the move, and this focuses at the policy level. So that's what, what Dr. Fayed was referring to. And essentially it uh, took place in, over the past uh, six months and it involved about uh, 54 different agencies of, of all different levels um, and uh, about 130 participants. And this is part of the consultation uh, continuing really today. Um, next slide, please. And I, I won't repeat this. I just want to focus in on a couple of these points because Andrea's really covered this, you know, the, the issues well, the, the why this matters, um, the, the, the increasing numbers of, of displaced children. Uh, and their caregivers, the the long term impacts that they can face due to exposure to violence, dislocation from their homes, um, missing out on schooling, and also um, um, Allison and others have have talked about the reality that that you know research says there's there's quite a bit of evidence, particularly in the last five years, that shows, you know, it, in terms of uh, efficacy of interventions adapting these interventions to you know culture and engaging certain spiritual positive coping uh, mechanisms can actually improve um, the mental health outcomes but why are we talking we're talking specifically about community based approaches today we're talking about community pss and so just to ground that um, to pss specifically you know we're talking about in community based approaches engaging the existing resources and networks um, it it's about engaging the, the the families, the the existing supports, the existing belief systems and practices and resources locally to galvanize uh, and improve long-term well-being and, and recovery. And so it's about helping children on the move and their caregivers to you know restore a sense of normalcy, safety, and security. And so you know this this whole segment really focuses on the community-based aspect of PSS, and it's impossible with this population because of the high prevalence of their of faith beliefs um, globally. I think it's about eighty-four percent, but also on the rise. Um, you know, to to avoid talking about you know if we're going to engage these local resources, um, the, these these local actors. You know, we can't really avoid talking about uh, faith and. Uh, trying to understand the worldview and translate and bridge uh, those relationships. Um, uh, next slide, please. As, as Allison said and others, you know, th this is not a new thing. This is actually about living out um, the existing standards and fulfilling the, the, the 
the conventions and the statutes that we're all meant to, and we're all striving to, to achieve. And one of those is the, the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, but also, next slide please, also in the um, protection sphere, you know, within the minimum standards of child protection and, uh, and humanitarian action from the Alliance it, itself in, in 2019, you know, there is the same kind of the same principle is also deeply rooted that it's, you know, we're talking about an individual, you know, survivor centered uh, response that's appropriate to age, gender, ability, cultural, religious background, among others. So this is about fulfilling those standards. Next slide, please. And I just want to be clear as well, just to reiterate what we're not talking about. Um, we are definitely not talking about identifying um, a population by their faith or identity and then automatically saying, because this group is Christian, we're engaging the churches to do this because we're going we're gonna to do this kind of practice. We're going to set up this kind of belief. We're going to use this kind of language. Absolutely not. That actually does violate our principles. What we are talking about is very, it's why it's complex and it'll take hard work. It's very individualized, very household level adaptation to really identify um, what type of existing belief system, uh, what type of existing practices, relationships, persons, does that individual, does that child want to have involved or not? Uh, in their in their in their support, and that's what keeps us uh, in the, the 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 space of neutrality and seeking to be responsive. And we would want to do that even if we're talking about gender or other issues. This is not just about faith, but that's one area that that we need to um, we need to focus on and make sure we're doing. Next slide, please. The first principle has already been captured really well by Dr. Fayard, and it's essentially the reality that uh, one of the biggest obstacles to children accessing this is that globally um, in our responses, we frontline workers, donors, uh, the coordination bodies in the, in the field, the MHPSS coordination meetings that kind of oversee who's doing what where, tend to discourage and outright in some cases just deny discussion on, okay, this group needs hijabs, this group has asked for a prayer space, this group has asked for materials, this child needs this kind of food or not this kind of food for their faith, they have this holiday. You know, the, this type of conversation is often automatically excluded on the understanding that this upholds neutrality. But as has already been discussed really well, um, it actually ends up you end up dislocating the children further from their own identity and faith, and you end up sort of proselytizing a secular worldview and try to, you know, you're almost saying, my world, this is our valid space, yours is not. Secondly, um, it's already been discussed as well that there's this disconnect sometimes in cultural competency by us as, as field workers and providers, like not understanding the, why people, children, and, uh, hello? Uh, if you could put yourself on mute, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, that's what I was saying. Get off the stage. You're done. Um, so essentially, um, you know, why suffering happens? What is the cause of illness? Is it evil spirits? Uh, is it am I being punished for something? Um, what are what is, the, what is the treatment? What is the role of the sacred text and treatment? You know, what 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 are these functions? And we, we live in very different worlds so we can be having these incredible interventions, we think, uh, that are completely disconnected from the, the sense of the, the way that people make meaning um, of suffering and also the strategies for coping that as, as at more and more evidence shows, many of these strategies are highly effective and do actually increase the effectiveness of the intervention itself. And also in some contexts where there are a lot of indigenous communities, um, the indigenous or minority groups, minority phase, but also minority ethnic groups, uh, we don't have the language capacities to really work with them and adapt to them um, on a case by case basis. We tend to sometimes lump them into the majorities and expect them and then have a one size fits all approach. And that actually also dislocates children you know, from their indigenous roots, from, from their minority backgrounds that, that they need to engage in a community-based response, um, in a type of community-based response in their own recovery and coping to have that normalcy and security restored. And lastly, the broken trust and communication 
um, between the local faith actors and external responders, Dr. Fayard um, talked about really, really well. Um, the suspicion on both sides that you're going to force me to do certain things in order to get money, you know, to not be my, fulfill my identity as a local faith actor. And then on this side, that you're going to be proselytizing and only serving people of your of their own faith. And let's just be honest, that's true. On both sides, that happens. The coercion and, uh, but there is a common ground and there is a group in the middle of agencies and faith actors who share the commitment to neutrality and share commitments to doing appropriate, adaptive, responsive, faith sensitive MHPSS. And it's those groups that we need to identify each other and have a capacity sharing relationship where we're supporting with technical support, but also being adapted ourselves to learn from them what is the culturally appropriate way to adapt and respond to this group. Next slide. I'm just going to quickly run through um, these as well. It's already, sorry, I'm a bit covered up here. Um, just a couple of things that haven't been mentioned before. Um, so practically, how does this happen? This happens at the assessment stage. So the very first assessment you know, that we're doing with these populations, we need to have some sort of standardized language where we're identifying, do you want faith language, faith practices, spaces, persons, actors to be a part of your response? And uh, what would that look like? So it happens at the, in a practical way at that stage. Um, also, it happens at the design stage. If as desire of these the, the children and caregivers want that type of thing to be involved in a program design and it, 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 it faith sensitive response would actually engage the children and and the caregivers and and those faith persons that they've identified to be involved in the, the project design itself to speak into potential adaptations next slide please Similarly, um, it's about investing in really context specific assessments and staff training, not saying because you work in a Sunni Muslim area, this is how it's approached. It's really on a, a community by community basis, um, population basis, like who are we working with, who are we responding to, what are the underlying meanings given to things, what are the, the appropriate approaches, um, and really training staff. We have such high turnover that you have a new person every six months, one year, how are we training staff so that new ones coming in are not, are not continually out of sync? Um, and it's a very context specific investment that, that agencies, um, NGOs and INGOs you need to be doing, and UN uh, need to be doing. Um, and last couple of things, just the language issue that we talked about, making sure that we have, you know, we're accessible and we have the, the local language, the minority languages, the indigenous languages represented uh, in the services, investing in these capacity bank uh, sharing partnerships, and it takes work to identify and work and, and, and form these partnerships, and it, it is difficult, but it can be done. Uh, last slide. And the last point just to make that's the, the, the policy brief is just essentially, you know, we, so I talked about training and supporting building the technical capacity related to psychosocial support of local faith leaders. And Dr. Fire talked about that as well, because reality is they're the first responders often and they're staying. Um, but one point I just want to make on that is that we really want to be sure we're looking for the invisible women of faith who do not have formal titles, in part because in some places, 50% of the population will only have access to women who are faith leaders, not men. And in other cases, uh, we don't want to be excluding um, women of faith without titles. Um, we want them to be able to um, be as in leadership and empowered as much as anyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Radle. Thank you for explaining very clearly the key recommendations in the policy brief. And as we said, we've really very much tried to put the accent on the community PSS. So we have framed, we have given the bigger picture, we have presented some of the evidence, but I think what will be also very interesting for us all today is to hear from some of those community practices and from some stories from the field. So we are very honored to have with us uh, uh, Dr. Jennifer from the Joint Learning Initiative, as well as uh, Claudia that is uh, joining us from the field in World Vision. They will be presenting experiences from two very different regions, but that in regard of children on the move are facing some of the very similar challenges that have been outlined so far by Alison, Dr. Kathleen and Dr. Callers. 
So I would like to first hear a little bit from Dr. Jennifer, her experience, uh, how uh, faith sensitive MHPSS uh, can be practically implemented in the field so that we re really will look at the community level and we see how some of these uh, practices can be strengthened. So Dr. Jennifer, over to you. Great, thank you, Eleonora, um, and hi, everyone. So good to be here with you today. Um, as Eleonora has mentioned, I um, work for the Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities, or GLI for short. Um, GLI, for those of you who don't know it, is an international collaboration of researchers and practitioners um, from all over the world who have a shared interest in religion and religious actors in global development, humanitarian action, and um, peace building. And what I wanted to do today is I wanted to share some of our experiences in um, the area of MHPSS and FACE with you, linking it to the presentation of um, Kathleen now, um, because there were really quite um, a few points that um, could really relate to based on our work. Um, and we were actually running um, uh, roughly at the same time as um, Kathleen and the team were doing their study, we were actually running quite a similar project, um, but with a much more local focus. Um, and that's what I wanted to briefly speak about today. Um, this was a project that was co-led by myself and um, our colleague, um, Dr. Mohammed Abu Hilal, who unfortunately can't be here with us today, but he works with um, a small NGO um, that's called Syria Pride Future, um, a Syrian-led NGO that works in the area of MHPSS and um, that's being run out of Turkey at the moment. And um, JLI um, and SBF, um, which is short for Syria Pride Future, we have been working um, together for several years um, on MHPSS and faith. Um, and it actually all started um, with Muhammad reaching out to us um, because he wanted to produce evidence on MHPSS and faith. And um, we started working on that then. Um, and the approach that we took was a research capacity sharing approach. So capacity sharing is obviously one of the buzzwords, the key words that has already come up now in the in Carlos's um, presentation. And that's very much what we try to do as well, but with a focus on research. And what we wanted to do was to produce evidence on MHPSS and faith in the Syrian context, um, but produce research by, um, by Syrian practitioners. So have Syrian practitioners who are not researchers actually produce the research themselves. Um, and um, we did that. We um, provided research training to them. We had research capacity sharing sessions, um, developed, um, developed the research design together, and then the SBF team went off to interview Syrian MHPSS professionals who worked in Syria and with refugee communities in Turkey. And quite a few of the points that Kathleen mentioned in her presentation, they also came up in that research. So this, um, um, this, um, this understanding of the neutrality um, principles as um, 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 yeah, as actually something um, as a guideline that actually prevents us to work um, on religion, right? So that's something that also came up very, very strongly. The Syrian MHPSS professionals that we spoke with, they were really, really hesitant to work on faith and um, um, on faith. And at the same time, they acknowledged that it was important, but they didn't really know what to do. So again, we've spoken about the need for training. This is really something that has come up in our work as well. We really need um, training for MHPSS professionals um, in this area. Um, another issue is um, obviously funding. Um, I don't think I need to tell that to anyone here in the room. Um, you might have the most amazing ideas, but if the money and the resources are not there, um, that's it's very difficult to actually work in this area, especially if you um, are opting for community focused and participatory approaches because these take time, right? This is also something that has come up in the previous presentations. Um, 
I guess um, just very quickly two points that are very important for us um, um, and that we would really hope um, to see other um, practitioners working um, in this area implement more is um, uh, we speak so much about um, localization and then to some extent also decolonization. Can we implement this in this work? Can we make sure that this work is actually being led by communities and that um, that we involve um, practitioners, that we involve community members and activists in knowledge production on the topic? And then very, very briefly, because I'm, um, I think I'm about to be told um, off for running over time. <laughs> um, the, the last point um, that um, I would like to add as a Muslim woman from a Muslim perspective is that a lot of this work is actually dominated by Christian organizations. And that is not to take away from the importance and the value of that work. But I have actually quite often come across approaches that are clearly based on Christian theology. And then when you ask, um, but what about what about other faiths? Um, and you find out they actually work with Muslim communities. They're like, oh, it's fine because Jesus is really important in Islam, too. And that's true. But maybe it's a bit more complicated than that. So that's also something that I would like to see some more attention um, um, being paid to by practitioners who are interested in actually implementing this kind of um, principles more in their work. And on that note, thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing from Carolina. No, Claudia, sorry. <laughs> thank you, thank you to all. I'm, I'm very proud to be in this space and to, to be a presenter with all these people that knows about what we're talking about. And I'm very happy to say that, like Dr. Fayar was saying, in Venezuela, we're turning a challenge into a great opportunity. First of all, I would like to, next slide please. I would like to show why Venezuelans are emigrating our country and are, are beginning to start the second worldwide migrant crisis all over the world. The hunger indicators in Venezuela have increased to 6.5 million people in the last month. The cost of the basic food basket for April was about around 500 bucks. And which means that a family needs to at least have 85 minimum wage to live. Progressive deterioration of the economic and basic service, electricity, telecommunications, uh, the Venezuelan health system has collapsed. And also the educational health system has collapsed as, as well. Right now we have only two days for the schools to be open in the whole territory and the, the kids are receiving classes only half time. Next, please. We have developed a very strong alliance since um, 219, when we have the, the COVID pandemic in Venezuela, and we developed a network, a network of faith-based and churches organizations in Venezuela. And this is an, an initiative that we are trying to, to focus in Venezuela to trying to stop the, the families to get the sensation of need to, to leave the country to be in a better place. Next, please. Until, uh, thanks to, the, so to this network, the Esperanza Sin Fronteras Network, we have uh, the, the chance to be all uh, over Venezuela and all the municip all the states and all the municipalities. And we are very happy uh, with, to have this because it's not only allowed us to go further and to go to the most vulnerable uh, communities in Venezuela, but also to other agencies and organizations that are trying to help the Venezuelan people inside Venezuela. Next, please. The Red Esperanza Sin Fronteras until last year, we have a, a, around 1,600 affiliated churches. We have 549 affiliated faith-based organizations in Venezuela. We have registered more than 3,000 volunteers. We have trained around 2,600 uh, 2, volunteers in um, humanitarian action, in humanitarian principles, in humanitarian um, ways to serve the, the, the people that are vulnerable 
And also we have uh, trying to develop leadership, leadership skills in the, in the faith leaders in Venezuela. We impacted around 248,000 people through Instagram and Facebook and other um, social resources. Next, please. Why engage with FBOs in Venezuela? Because they are established as one of the trusted members with their local communities, making them well positioned to act and provide critical support during crisis. Because they are respected by authorities, especially at the local level. They have a long-term commitment communities, particularly in areas where the government is unable to provide service because thanks to them, we have been able to expand our training in protection and safeguarding, the development of safe spaces for children, and the sensibilization of faith leaders and the communities themselves on child protection issues. Because we need allies to spiritually strengthen our children and their families. And I really believe that this is a, a challenge that we have managed, a challenge that has allowed us to, to be with the people of Venezuela, to be with them in the crisis and, and, and to give them hope. I think that's one of the main reasons that we're trying to develop this network, to give them hope. And right now, and I'm gonna turn this in Spanish, estamos organizando una red de voluntariado interreligioso por primera vez en Venezuela. un voluntariado juvenil donde, donde están integradas la Iglesia Católica, la Iglesia Cristiana, la Iglesia Judía y la Iglesia Islámica. Estamos enseñándole a estos jóvenes a cómo trabajar, cómo hacer proyectos, cómo apoyar organizaciones como la nuestra, World Vision en Venezuela. Y sobre todo, cómo enfrentar los problemas que tiene la comunidad venezolana. Para hacerlos sentir acompañados. Para hacerlos sentir que no están solos. Y como decía alguien antes de mí, para entender que la fe no se queda. Que la fe siempre va con nosotros. Y que como nos recuerdan permanentemente nuestros líderes en World Vision, nuestra fe es la que nos hace entender que siempre habrá un sol que salga mañana. Estamos tratando de um, expandir esta red no solamente a Venezuela, sino a otros países de América Latina. Como Colombia, Perú, Ecuador y Chile donde ya tenemos iglesias que están siendo parte de este network. Thank you. Thank you very much to all for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia. These are uh, very practical experiences that bring uh, also hope to everyone in the field, also because they tackle some of the challenges. I mean, the creativity, the using of different resources of media so that you can reach also the most vulnerable and now you're bringing communities together. And also thank you for addressing one of the points that was made also by Dr. Jennifer in terms of needing more interfaith approaches 
and for needing that when we talk about faith sensitivity is really a faith sensitivity that is towards the diverse faiths as well and that include the theological reflections and adaptations of working the children from the multiple faiths i think this is a very important point uh, uh, for everyone here at, at arigato international the organization i represent is very proud of convening the global network of religions for children that brings us also all here working together from the different faiths and the different worldviews as well, which includes also the secular perspective, as many of you said. So I think that what we said is really about the creation of these safe platforms to address that elephant in the room that we also saw in the very graphic presentation of Dr. Fayard. And as Dr. Jennifer said, how do we do that more and more increasingly at the local level, developing the, re the resources Sources and the expertise of local researchers and local MHPSS and PSS practitioners, because only that we can really flip the script and make sure that these resources are faith sensitive and also culturally adapted for children on the move and their families. And with that, I want to hand over to my colleague Carolina from the United States Institute of Peace for a call to action. Carolina, over to you. You are unmuted, so you can unmute and maybe speak a little bit louder. Thank you, Carolina. Is it working? Okay. Uh, thank you, Eleonora, and thank you everyone for participating in this event. I am happy to have the opportunity of reflect on the speaker's presentation, and I am going to highlight some of the key messages or takeaways from this conversation. This has been an incredibly uh, fruitful and nurturing conversation. And I welcome you all to continue this um, discussion in, in other spaces. The first thing that I want to highlight is how recognizing that forced displacement, it is a major life crisis and brings questioning on the meaning of life and on the identity and uncertainty um, relates with the importance of understanding the role of faith and the place it has in the lives of children on the move. As uh, some of the speakers has mentioned, people move with their faith and can rely on their faith in times of, of instability. And this is a source of coping for many of them. Uh, the initiative I lead in USAP, the Religion and Psychosocial Support for Displaced Trauma Survivors, recognize how um, in Colombia and Venezuela, and also in the context of Burma, this is occurring, how people that have been forcibly displaced relied on their faith, whatever this may be, to cope with the stresses of migration. There is also um, clear information about how building partnerships between mental health actors and religious actors can contribute to make more accessible and more effective MHPSS interventions. Many of the speakers discuss how it is important to have capacity sharing between these two communities to ensure that the services that are provided to the children actually cater to their needs not only in terms of faith, but also in terms of their cultural identities and the dynamics of um, cultural uh, elements that will impact the treatment of mental health challenges. Uh, it was discussed how the policy brief emphasized the importance of having cultural assessments and faith assessments that truly understand how these two components relate with the identity of the individual, how it will impact the process of making meaning of suffering, but also the process of understanding healing and moving forward um, after experiencing a difficult event. During our research, we also have found how failing to do these assessments and this rigorous uh, questioning of the place of faith and culture in the life of uh, forced displaced communities creates an additional layer to access MHPSS service. And in the long term can lead to having a bigger deterioration of mental health and emotional well-being in the populations. The second thing that I want to highlight 
it relates with developing and investing in these communities of practices, these spaces that allow to create dialogue, to foster collaboration, to find that common ground, to foster that religious literacy that is needed both on the mental health sector to understand how and when faith can play a positive role or how it can play a negative role as well in the process of addressing mental health but also how religious actors need concrete ways um, and understanding of how to address mental health, how to provide psychosocial support from a do no harm stand, and when to refer to a mental health professional because specialized services are needed. These kind of spaces are these kind of dialogues in which we bring together policy recommendations based from work on the ground, but also evidence from research that we have collected through different initiatives, and also communities of practices in which practitioners can actually discuss in practical ways how to move forward, how to make collaboration something that is practical and tangible. And the final thing that I want to highlight, it relates with supporting those faith leaders that have informal roles or that do not have the big hat, as we may say. Uh, this may be women of faith, this, this may be youth or other community actors that have the potential to reach out to key members of the community that are struggling with mental health issues. In our research, for example, we have found that women um, of faith may be best positioned to connect with women that have experienced sexual and gender-based violence, and also best uh, position to provide support to girls that have experienced this in the process of migration. So understanding this and capitalizing on this, it's important to find ways in which accessibility and effectiveness of MHPSS is improved and also recognizes the resources that are already on the ground. Something that has mentioned uh, broadly in terms of ensuring ownership of the processes in MHPSS, but also sustainability of the initiatives when are community-led and when are designed and implemented through the community lens. Um, this may not be comprehensive of all the important message that the speakers communicated today, um, but I try my best to highlight what were the key discussions and patterns um, amongst many of them. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. This was a, a hard task indeed because a lot was shared. And just as a reminder, many of the resources we have uh, talked about today have been already shared in the chat, but we will continue to share. And we will send also soon the finalized version of the policy brief that Dr. Kathleen has uh, uh, talked about today. Before we close, I would like to bring the greetings and also the uh, you know uh, messages of our colleague from the GIZ, uh, Alena Melnau, that works on MHPSS in the Middle East, based out of Lebanon. Uh, for some technical issues, she wasn't able to log in in the platform, but uh, uh, GIZ has been supporting. I'm there. Eleonora. <laughs> yes, she's here. Okay, so please, if you can put the spotlight on Alena, this is a very, a very glad Alena. So over to you for the closing remarks. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm uh, disguised as Jennifer because due to some technical issues, I was not able to access the platform. Anyways, we are over time. Um, I, I don't want to take much time since it was an impressive session. It really was, um, and I don't think I have much to add. Just one personal reflection. I work in a regional project on mental health and psychosocial support in the Middle East, and we are bringing practitioners from all levels together in a dialogue. And FACE, since it is such an important topic in this region, is coming up all the time. And what I notice in these communities and um, people we work with is a lot of discomfort and and insecurity about how to address the topic of faith, especially among practitioners who are maybe coming from secular organizations or from secular backgrounds. So I do think I agree with everything that has been said with regards to investing in funding, investing in capacity development, investing in long-term programs, but let's also invest in those safe spaces 
that allow practitioners to also reflect on their own report with space and potential sources of discomfort or stereotypes, um, assumptions about how face-based MHPSS looks like. This is why I find your work from the Alliance so important because it sheds light on a topic that really raises a lot of question marks. And what you did is to find some answers to those question marks and let's continue to invest in this reflection and in this dialogue because we owe it to the people we are meant to serve who need face in many cases for their coping and for their stability. And that was it. And thank you, Eleonora, for having me on this session. Thank you. Thank you, Alena. And this is, again, a very practical reminder for us all of why these spaces of dialogue and collaboration are needed and also what we mean when we talk about cross cooperation, collaborations and, and capacity building among the different sector and really building those bridges uh, and addressing in the room. I think this ends our session. I know we're running out of time and many sessions are planned for today by the Alliance. So I will end over to the organizers from some maybe final housekeeping. So over to you, Elspeth. Thank you.